So you wanna start drop shipping in 2024. Awesome, I love it. Let me just start by saying that yes, this still works. No, drop shipping is not too competitive. And yes, you can drop ship profitably if, and this is a big if, you do things the right way. So what I wanna do in this video, which is different than most of the stuff we put up here, is actually talk to you as if I was sitting down with a friend that was serious about starting a drop shipping store in 2024 and just go over, literally off the top of my head, the things that I would share with them in order to give them the best chance of success. So there will be probably some screen shares throughout this presentation, but mostly it'll just be me talking. So if you're listening along and you wanna minimize the window, feel free to do that. But again, this is gonna be kind of an informal conversation, if you will, for you, if you are out there looking to dropship profitably and start dropshipping in 2024. Now, the first thing that I'm gonna tell you is if you want to do this, if you really want to do this, literally before you do anything, before you sign up for Shopify, before you try to find products to sell and research ways to get traffic and literally go through what has to be done to make this work, before you do any of that, really have a conversation with yourself of whether or not you are serious about this and committed to it. Because although, yes, dropshipping does work, and yes, this is a very real business, it is a business. And it's only going to work for you if you're willing to do the work that needs to be done. So if this is just an idea you have and something you want to try out and see what happens, I'll tell you right now, you're better off not even trying it because you're not going to put in the effort. Now, that might sound harsh, but I'd rather you save your time than put it into something you are not serious about. Okay. Let's say though you are, right? And you tell me, you know what, Anton? No, I, I know this works. I've seen it work for you. I've listened to your countless interviews with students it's worked for. I am serious. I do want to do this. Okay, awesome. Now what we have to do is actually start talking about how to drop ship the right way because drop shipping really is a high level term, right? It's simply a method of fulfillment for orders. And these can be orders that honestly people sell through mail order catalogs that people get, you know, delivered for free and wonder why they show up. Well, a lot of those catalogs, people will call them or send in their order form or even go to the website listed in the catalog. They'll buy a product, that product will show up to their house. Guess what? Most of the time, those products are drop shipped. What that means is that the actual company that is shipping them is not the company that is selling them. Now, if you want to compare this to maybe a, a more traditional retail setting, picture a store like Target or, I don't know, Dick's. I'm thinking of this because they're like next to each other where I live. But if you go into Target and you buy, I don't know, some detergent for your clothes, and then you go and you buy a toy for your kid, they're not Target branded products, right? They're coming from other brands. So with dropshipping, it's the same thing, right? We are the retailer, like Target is the retailer, or if you went into Dick's and bought the new Callaway AI smoke driver, and then bought a pair of um, you know running shoes from Nike, right? They don't say dicks on them, that doesn't matter. You're not concerned, you're buying them from someone beyond, uh, besides, I should say, Callaway or Nike, because you're buying them from a retailer. Now, the way that I do drop shipping and the way that I would encourage you to do it, again, if you're serious about this, is to have that mindset going in. What that means is you are going to become a retailer. Of course, you're not going to stock inventory. You're not gonna have any physical locations, but you are going to be a place, a store, an online store, that people can go to to buy what it is they want to buy. So now that we have that out of the way, let's talk about actual products, right? And the type of products that I sell and that I've been selling you know, probably since 2009, I think that's when I transitioned from importing into dropshipping. And there are a very specific set of criteria that I look for and that I would definitely encourage you to look for. Because again, dropshipping, it is this very high level term. And if you go online and watch YouTube videos or listen to podcasts or read blog posts, you'll see that some people are dropshipping from eBay or from Amazon or from China or through apps that have products that come in from all around the world. And while those are all technically dropshipping, again, that is not what I do and that is not what I would encourage you to do. Instead, what you want to do is pick whatever niche you want to be in, right? What type of products do you want to build? What type of store do you want to build? And yes, I would recommend being a niche specific store meaning you choose one product type to sell. So not one product, but one product type. You know, an example I can give you is right now I'm at a standing desk 
I'm sitting here, but if I was going to sell standing desks, I would build a standing desk store. And just like Target sells for other brands, just like Dick sells for other brands, I would find every quality brand out there that makes standing desks that was actually, that was actually willing, I should say, to sell them through other retailers, which by the way, most of them are. And just to get out like a common, I don't know, concern or hesitation now, a lot of the companies that we sell for, they do not sell direct to the public. Instead, what they do, literally what their business is, is making high quality products and then their sales, their distribution is not their business. They work with people like us, possibly like you, like countless others that have retail stores. Sometimes they're offline, most of the time they're online and they are the sales channels for the brands that make these products. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the niches then. Now that you understand you're gonna build a niche specific store and that you're going to want to sell for all of the top quality brands in that niche that are what I call dropship friendly, meaning they're willing to work with online only retailers. So my advice is I'll give you like a few quick pointers and just like I would be having this conversation with you know a good buddy right now that was like, Anton, you know, it's been 15 years. Can you finally tell me what you're doing? None of them have ever asked. It's fine. But let's say you do have more questions. Please just ask them in the comments and I'm more than happy to you know, respond to them, make future videos. So use that comment box. It's there for a reason. But what I would say is like, as you start this brainstorming process, right? And you know, at this point, you know, you're serious about this. You know, you're going to build a retail store. What I would say is one of the first things to definitely keep in mind as you're brainstorming different niche ideas is make sure you're not selling inexpensive products because yes, you can build an online retail store that sells some of those inexpensive products like many people out there do, but it is much easier to actually make real money when you are selling high ticket products. Now for us on the very low end, we want that to be about $200, but in average on our stores, the average sale price is closer to $1,000. And the reason we do this, it's really, there's many reasons that go into it, but the short of it is that the more expensive products we sell, Basically, it requires less input, so it requires less time because we need less sales to make the amount of money we want to make. And I'll just draw this on the iPad quickly because this might be helpful as like a visual representation. Let's say you were selling a low ticket product, right? So something that you might sell for $10 to a customer. So I'll put sale price. And then on the higher end, let's say you were closer to where we are with an average order value of around $1,000. Well, with our method of drop shipping and really with most methods of drop shipping, the profit margin, so I'll put P for profit margin is about 30%. Now, what that means is regardless of what type of product you sell or at what price point, you could probably expect to make around 30% net profit. And I'll give you some more advice on how to make sure your margins are good a little bit later on as we keep talking here. But what that would mean is your actual net profit per sale on those low ticket products would be about $3 every time you sold something. And on the high ticket products, it would be 300. Again, both of those numbers come from one sale. And as you can imagine, if you're only making a few bucks per sale, the business really becomes something that is not fun to run because yes, you can do tons of order volume and have your numbers actually add up to something real, something that could change your life. But to do that, it's going to require thousands upon thousands upon thousands of orders, a lot of customer service, a lot of shipments, a lot of order tracking, and it just becomes a huge headache. So. If, you know, right out of the gate, you could make literally a hundred times more profit per sale, why wouldn't you do that? Again, for one sale, not meaning you need to sell more products, meaning you don't need many orders to start equaling lots of money. So that's the first thing I would say, again, when you're doing your niche research here, look for high ticket products. Now, let's talk about margins a little bit because I mentioned that 30% and you might be thinking, well, does that just mean if a company has a product for, let's say, $1,000 wholesale price, I'll sell it for $1,300 and that would be a 30% markup and I'll make 30%. No, that's not what it means. What we do and what I would encourage you to do is sell for suppliers that are known as MAP suppliers. So M-A-P suppliers. And MAP stands for minimum advertised price. And this is huge in really protecting our profit margins and also the brands we sell for. So I'm just gonna give you an example and we would never sell anything like this, by the way, I'll talk more about that in just a little bit. But let's say you decided you wanted to sell, you know, iPhones. Well, 
Apple has a minimum advertised price for different models of the phones with different amounts of storage and different screen sizes and different model numbers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But let's just say that map for this phone was, I have no idea, maybe it's $1,000, right? We'll make it easy. Well, if they said map was $1,000, that would mean that every company out there selling it could not sell it for below 1,000. And that is what every store out there you saw that sold this would list it for. Now, let's just say the hypothetical wholesale price here was $500, right? So I'll put here for 1,000, that could be map and the 500 could be wholesale. And let's just say they did not have these type of pricing policies and a new store opened up and they said, wow, if we sold iPhones for $700, everybody else is selling it for a thousand, we're gonna get all the sales. And guess what? That would probably be true. But the problem with that is now iPhones from Apple would no longer be valued at that thousand dollars or whatever their actual price is, right? I'm just using random numbers. I don't know the exact pricing. And what that does is actually devalue that company because now their products aren't seemingly as high value or as high quality. So on one hand, this protects the brand's value, but on the other hand, in return, it protects the retailer's margins, again, like us. So let's just use another example here. We'll go back to the standing desk I mentioned earlier, and let's say the supplier had a wholesale price to us, which was 500. What we wanna see is the map price be about double that. So in this scenario, the 500 times two would be 1,000. And if we sold the product for 1,000, then we have our expenses, right? So we have our, in this case, $500 for cost of goods sold. And then we have our shipping costs. So I don't know, let's just say it's $150, we'll take an average. Then we have the money that's left over from that. In this case, it would be, what is that, 300 and 50. And from there, we have our other expenses that really are variable, right? Do we wanna run ads for this product? Do we want to rely on paid traffic? You know, what other apps are we paying for? Which by the way, things like Shopify, which I should let you know is the platform that I use and that I recommend, you can use that for three days for free and then you can get three months for only $1 a month. So literally over 90 days for $3, it's insane. And even after that, it's only $39 a month or it comes out to $29 a month if you wanna prepay for a year. And if you're afraid of you know, that costs, I would say, again, this probably isn't for you because even after a couple orders, that number just becomes so small, it's, it's literally negligible. It's one of the, the lowest expenses and Shopify just gives you so much compared to these other platforms out there that there is no reason not to use it. And yeah, we'll talk about Shopify in a little bit, but just keep this in mind. Again, when you're doing your product research, you wanna go high ticket and those are the reasons why. Now, just to expand on that a little bit, you know, we showed you earlier, I gave you the, the iPhone example, right? But I said we would never sell products like this. And there's a couple of reasons and these are things you should keep in mind as well as you're doing your product research. One of them is this niche, right, of cell phones, let's say, is definitely one that has tons of brand loyalty. People are going to buy an iPhone, or maybe they're gonna buy some Samsung phone, or maybe a tiny percent of all phone buyers are going to buy some other brand. But this is a niche that is definitely dominated by a few big players. And for our business model with dropshipping, that is not something we wanna get into. Because if you think about it, how are we possibly going to compete with the biggest retailers in the world that are selling these exact products that everyone is already buying and searching for? It's a losing game. So I don't do that. I wouldn't even say you should even try to do that or even think about that. Instead, what you wanna do is look for niches where there's no brand loyalty. So again, we talked about what brand loyalty means. People wanna buy something, they kind of already know like where they want it from. Maybe not the store, but they know the brand name on that product they want. What I like to do is to sell products where people can care less what brand name is on it. You know, I gave you again the standing desk example. Might be getting old by now, but I have one, two, three, four. I have five of them in our office here. I have one of them at home and I don't even know, like I could check the brand names on them, but when I was buying them, that was the last thing on my mind. What, what brand name makes this desk? I knew I wanted different sizes and different finishes. I knew I wanted ones that supported different weights. I knew I wanted ones that had different depths. So when I was buying, those were the things I was interested in, not what brand name makes this. I couldn't care less. And that is what you want to do when you're brainstorming niche ideas. Try to find things that have lots of variety. Try to find things where really, again, people just, they don't care. They want something that is a certain size maybe or shape or color, but the brand name is the last thing on their mind. And if you're stuck, right, when you're doing this research on your own, I'll just give you a quick website that you could definitely check out that will show you tons of different niche ideas. And you might've heard of this one before, but Wayfair.com. 
And um, let me see, my keyboard's not connected to Bluetooth. There we go. So we're gonna go to Wayfair.com. And this is a site that is almost primarily drop shipping. It's almost 100% drop shipping, I should say. They do have like a few little pop-up stores they do, and they do make some of their own brands. But basically everything on here is drop shipped. And you'll notice that they have tons of different categories. Again, I'm not saying to go here because you wanna build a store that has tons of different categories. Again, we want to be the experts in our niche. We want to eventually become the authority in our niche. So we're not building a store like this. But if you just come here and click into any of the sections and then go to shop all, you could see even all the subcategories. And this is where you can start to get ideas, again, if you're stuck. So if I go in here to, let's say, game tables and game room furniture, I'll just share the screen so that you can see it here. Um, we can see all the different categories that they have. So let's just click into game and game tables. And from here, you could see you could niche down even further. By the way, when I say niche down, that's what I mean. I mean, get more specific with the product type. And when I'm doing that research and determining kind of how specific do I want to go, there is a bunch of criteria that I do look for. But one of the main things is, are there at least 20 brands that make these products that are willing to drop ship? And are there at least 100 products between those 100 brands? So something to definitely keep in mind and look for it during your research. But let's just click into the pool table category here. And then what I'm gonna do, you can see here they have 453 of these products on their store, so well over that 100. And then if I go into the sidebar here and click show more filters and I scroll down, you'll see it says brand. Now, most e-commerce stores have a either a brand section and they call it, typically it says brand, but maybe like a variation of that word. So just look for it as you're doing your research. And if you expand that and then click show all brands, you'll see in that category how many brands they sell for. So in this case, how many brands have these pool tables available? And let's just look in letter A, you know, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight in letter A alone, pretty sure we're gonna get to over our 20. And that is something you want to see. If you saw, you know, a handful of brands only, I don't, I'm not gonna say you can't build a store selling for only a handful of brands and do well and sell a bunch of stuff and make a bunch of money. But the reason that I don't like to do that is because when you do, um, what's the best way to describe it? Let's go back to like the Target example, right? Let's say Target only sold for two or three brands. Think about how much power those two or three brands would have over Target. If they wanted to you know, change their pricing and mark everything up tomorrow, if one of them somehow just was bad at managing business and went under, then Target would take a huge hit. And it's similar, you know, at least the thought process wise, when building these stores, we do not want to end up in a position where we're extremely profitable, but we're relying only on a handful of brands. We want to have our risk as low as possible. And one way to really lower that risk is by selling for multiple brands within the niche. And that's why I like to find at least 20 when doing the research. Now, I know, again, this is a lot to take in. Lucky for you, this is being recorded, so you can watch this back as much as you want. But if you find something like this, again, something that you, um, you know, you're, you're excited about, by the way, I say excited about, not passionate about, because the passion to really succeed with this, it comes down to you wanting something out of this business. It's not about the products. So out of all the stores I've built over the years, talking dozens of stores, I've never picked one because I was passionate about the product type. What I'm passionate about is the business. I love e-commerce, I love marketing, I love really being able to live the life that I want. And I know this business provides me with that, so I'm passionate about growing the business almost like a video game, that's how it feels to me. So don't think about, oh, I don't really care about 3D printers or couches or pool tables or horse saddles or whatever it is you're researching. Think about, does this fit the criteria and can I build a business around it? That's the, the right mindset to go into this with. But once you do that and you're at this point where you know you found products you like, you see there's enough suppliers out there on dropshipping stores, then it would be time to build a website. And what I'll do quickly is just show you what this might look like. I'll give you an example using a uh, dropship lifestyle demo store. And I'll just pull it up over here and we'll pull up Shaka Surfboards. So this is built using our newest version of the dropship lifestyle theme, which is called Manhattan. And I'll just quickly show you around. You can go to it later and check it out if you want to. But this site is not live in the sense that it has real products on it that you know it's not an actual business. It's what I call a demo store. The reason I want to share this now is because I want you to see the level of effort that we put into a Shopify store before we contact even our first supplier.
Now, the reason we do this is because the type of suppliers we want to work with are only going to work with us if they actually think that we're going to help their brand. Remember, the businesses that we want to sell for, the brands, the suppliers, whatever you want to call them, they work with us because we are one of their sales channels. So they focus on making excellent products, they focus on the branding, we focus on listing the products, bringing in traffic, to our stores, fulfilling the orders through the supplier that ships to the customer, making sure the customer has a great experience. So let's just say you did wanna sell pool tables and you skipped this step and you just called one of the companies. Let's come back here, try to find a random name here. Um, I don't know, let's find one that's uh, expensive. Let's say Hathaway Games. And you called Hathaway Games and said, hi, I wanna sell your products. And they said, where are you calling from? And you said, well, nowhere, but I'm thinking about building a store. They're gonna say no. So also important when it comes to these brands that we sell for, we are becoming authorized retailers to sell for them. So they are giving us permission, if you wanna think of it that way. We're not working through middlemen, we're not trying to find their products cheaper somewhere else online. We're reaching out to those brands, telling them we're contacting them through whatever store it may be, whatever domain name you pick. And after that, then we can become authorized retailers, we can list their products for sale, we can start running traffic, and we can start making money. So just keep that in mind. Um, Speaking of like, I guess the process, I mentioned this was a demo store, so you might think, well, do I need to build another store once I get an approval? No, when you get approvals, all you do is simply remove the demo products that are on the store and upload the, the live products, the real products. And I should also just mention this too, You know, when we put demo products on, we're not trying to deceive suppliers or anything. What we're doing is contacting them and saying, we have the store, you can go check it out. This is where we're calling from. We want to sell for your brand for reasons X, Y, and Z. And and our launch date is scheduled for whatever that date may be, something in the future. So they're not going there thinking this is some you know existing business that already has all this history. They know that it is set to launch whatever date that may be. And by going to it though, they can see what it looks like, they can see the quality of the store, and they can envision what their products would look like should they authorize us to become a retailer. So once you get to that step, basically the way it's gonna work is you're gonna contact these suppliers. They're gonna send you a usually one or two page PDF via email, which would be the supplier agreement. That's gonna show things like how returns work, which by the way, they typically go straight back to the supplier's warehouse. It's gonna show the map policy, so what that markup is. It'll share things also like how you place orders, who you send them to when they come in. So it'll have all that information. And then from there, you'll sign it, you'll send it back. And once you do, they'll send you the products that you can actually upload. So again, that's when you upload the real products. Now, after that, that's when, for me, things become the most fun, right? That's when we start really working on things like optimizing for conversions so that our future website visitors can turn into customers and where we actually start to run traffic. So um, when it comes to conversion optimization, you know, we already covered a whole bunch of stuff about kind of getting started with drop shipping. So I'm not gonna dive deep into that in this video or in this conversation. What I will say obviously is if you are a member of my coaching program, the Dropship Blueprint, in the members area, if you click into the Blueprint and then go into, let's expand all, if you go into module five, every lesson there is about optimizing for conversions. So 16 video lessons showing you everything we do to turn visitors into buyers. So you wanna do that before you spend a dollar on ads because what's the point of sending people to your store if your conversion rate won't be as high as it possibly can be? And again, module five of the blueprint shows you how to get that conversion rate to be as good as it can. Now. Conversion rates kinda, it's like they go hand in hand. There's two things that have to happen to make a conversion rate work well. So I'll draw this out for you too. Hopefully it might make it a, a bit easier to understand. And what the conversion rate that we're talking about now is referring to is what percentage of people that visit your store turn into customers. So let's just say hypothetically that you had 100 website visitors in a day. So 100, I wrote web sitters, we'll fix that. You had 100 website visitors in a day. Now, with our stores from quality traffic, which I'll show you in just a minute, what we wanna have is a 2.5% conversion rate. What that means is if we have 100 website visitors, we want that to turn into 2.5 sales. And let's just say, again, hypothetically, you were selling products with a $1,000 average order value, so $1,000 AOV, if you had that 2.5% conversion rate, you got those 2.5 sales, that would mean in that day, you would do $2,500 in sales. 
Now, if you don't focus on conversion optimization, your conversion rate can and will be much lower. Let's just say it was down at 1%. And by the way, it could be much less than 1%, but let's just say it was one. That would mean those 100 website visitors would be worth one sale to you. And again, if your average order value was $1,000, that would mean now in this day, you did $1,000 in sales instead of that 2,500 that was possible. That would mean you left $1,500 that day on the table. And again, this is just one day and there are many days in the month, there are many days in the year, there are many years that you will be in business. So this is something you want to address sooner rather than later because the money that you could be leaving on the table can really add up quickly. Now, with that being said, you know, when it comes to conversion rate, I was, I was talking about how it, it really, there's two things that go into play, right? You need your store optimized to convert, but even if your store is gorgeous, it has all the conversion elements built in and you don't have the right traffic, meaning up here, go back to the 100 people a day. If these are the wrong type of 100 people, then your store might still convert well under 1%. So what we focus on is of course, again, like I said, module five, but then we really focus on the type of website visitors that we are getting. So you're going to build your Shopify store like we talked about. That's the platform that we use that I definitely recommend you use for this business model. And then you have all these options in front of you of how am I going to get people to find me? What a lot of people do, you'll see this all over YouTube and different courses and podcasts, but they'll use Facebook ads, right? So maybe they're selling, let's just say surfboards and they'll say, okay, I'm gonna use Facebook ads. They'll go on Facebook, click create a campaign, make a campaign for their surfboard store and then use interest targeting and they'll choose an interest of something like surfers, right? People that are interested in surfing. And then they will send that traffic to their Shopify store and they'll get hundreds or thousands of visitors and none of them will buy. Well, why is that? It's because the people that are seeing these ads might be interested in surfing, but are they actually looking to buy a new surfboard? Do they just like watching surfing videos? Have they been surfing their whole lives and have the surfboard they want? Even if they do want a surfboard, do they wanna buy it that day? Do they know which one they want? Basically, they have very low buying intent, these people that you would be sending to your store from Facebook ads with interest-based targeting. So my advice is please save your money, do not use this type of ad. Instead, what I would encourage you to do in the beginning is really leverage free traffic. And one way you can do that is through something known as Google product listings. And I'll show you these, what they look like in just a minute. But basically when people search now for the, in this case, surfboards you have on your store, they're going to see an image of that surfboard. They're going to see the price. They're going to see your store name. And when they click that, they're gonna go right to the product page on your store for that product that they searched. Now, as you could probably imagine, that person has much more buying intent, meaning they're most they're more close, I should say, to the transaction than the person that might have liked a few surfing videos on Facebook. So this is free, highly recommend you set it up from day one. And then beyond that, what I would encourage you to do is to run Google Shopping ads. So this is paid and they actually appear in multiple places, but also just above Google product listings. And this is just where you're putting money behind your products to again, get those high quality searches for when people are looking for the products you actually sell. And again, just like with organic product listings, these lead to a high conversion rate. So let me switch screens and I'll just show you so you can see these for yourself, but I will search for surfboards on Google and then I'll just share the screen, screen quickly. And you can see here, I'm just on Google, I search surfboards, and up here, this whole row is all uh, Google Shopping ads. You'll see it says sponsored, and everything up here is an ad that these companies are paying to be here for. Again, the people that are gonna click these are gonna see the product photo, see the product name, the store name, the price. They're much more likely to turn into a customer than some random person on Facebook. Now, I'll also click into here to the shopping tab. And what I'll show you here, I mentioned those shopping ads appear in multiple places. They're also up here in the carousel. But when you scroll down, you'll see it says about these results. Everything under this gray line here is here for free. These are those Google product listings I was talking about. So again, you can pay $0 and be right here amongst these other businesses that are listing their products there and you can get free high quality traffic. So it's not just about getting all the traffic in the world. In fact, I recommend keeping your traffic as narrow as possible with qualified traffic sources and those are two amazing places to do it. 
Now, also just for sake of time, I'm not gonna dive deep into search engine optimization, but I will let you know that it is very easy to get organic traffic to product pages because there's not lots of competition there. And sometimes you could start ranking, meaning like have an organic listing in Google before you even do anything to try to optimize for it. But I'll also just share this quickly and show you in the members area of my coaching program, the Dropship Blueprint, which by the way, you should be a part of, in module six, in addition to Google and Microsoft and Meta and all the other trainings we have. I just recently created nine new lessons all about SEO, showing you how to do product page SEO and collection SEO and blog post SEO and how to promote your content. So all of that is gonna help you to, again, get more free traffic, but a whole lot more. Again, traffic's like my favorite part of this whole journey. Even if you don't know about it yet, get comfortable with it. You will by going through this and uh, it's fun. That's why there's 38 video lessons in module six of my, uh, my program here. But I'll share one more thing when it does come to traffic, right? Because even with these quality sources, people are gonna find you, but they're not going to buy right away, right? Not everybody is, of course, some people will. But if you're selling items for about a thousand bucks, it might take people a couple days to make the decision of do I wanna buy from the store? Do I wanna buy from elsewhere? So what do we do with everybody that leaves that doesn't buy? Well, if they go to our store from one of these quality traffic sources and they leave before buying, we remarket to them. Now, you've probably seen tons of remarketing ads on Facebook and Instagram and all over the internet. We run these on two different platforms. One of them is Meta, which of course is Facebook and Instagram, and the other is on Google. And Google basically allows these ads to be placed on I think the last number I saw was like 600 million websites. That sounds crazy, but I, I think that was the number. I, mean, I might be way off here, but it's basically like the whole internet almost that allows ads on their site uses Google AdSense to show ads and the website gets a cut of whoever clicks ads on their store. But we use that as a remarketing channel too. So when people leave our store without buying, we run remarketing ads on Meta and on Google. That sends them back to our store so that they can become customers. Now, we also do a lot of things with email marketing. So I'll just add that as kind of a side note because that's a little bit different of a process than what we're doing with Meta and Google. But this is just a great way to really make sure that you're making the most out of this quality traffic that you have from the beginning. Because remember, it's not hard to get traffic. You can go on Fiverr.com and buy 10,000 website visitors that go to you tomorrow. But if they're all from a country where you don't do business, from a bunch of bots or hacked sites that didn't look at, didn't look for, I should say, what it is you're selling, it doesn't matter. It's never going to turn into anything. So focus on the beginning of this funnel, if you will, with this quality traffic. And after they find you, if they still don't buy, again, that's when we send them back with these remarketing ads and with emails so they can become customers. So. That's kind of the short of it. Once you do all this, then I would say it's probably a good time to start considering maybe outsourcing and automating. What we like to do is once we really understand the business, because even though, like I said, I built dozens and dozens of these stores for myself and I've worked with thousands of Dropship Lifestyle members that have built them for themselves, every store does have its kind of unique operating procedures, especially because every store is gonna be selling four different suppliers. So my advice is set this all up, even if you can only put in 30 minutes a day or so of dedicated focused work, do that. And then once you're up and running and profitable, it's a great idea to start outsourcing. We have a massive team that is absolutely amazing that we've hired online. Many of them have been with us for years. So I would encourage you to do that as well. But again, not until your store is profitable, because at that point, you're going to have the money to reinvest into hiring. And of course, you're going to understand how your entire business should be run and basically be able to put together an owner's manual. So you can hand that off to somebody. And then you from there can just check in on your business whether that be 15 to 30 minutes a day, or you can spend your time elsewhere, like getting better at traffic, like getting more suppliers, like optimizing for even further conversions to get every extra sale you can out of everybody that visits in a day. So yeah, that's uh, pretty much all I'll share now. Again, I know we covered a ton. Again, luckily it's in a video format so you can go back and listen back to this, but I do hope you got value. And if you did, please do give me a like. If you were here, I'd give you a handshake and maybe a, maybe a cheers. But of course, any questions on this, let me know in the comments below. And if you do want a more advanced training on this where we go for about two hours deeper into all of these things, be sure to check out dropshipwebinar.com, which I will link up in the description as well. All right. Thank you. I appreciate you. And I'll talk to you next week. See everybody.